All right, so I don't know if I have 40 minutes worth of content, but probably 30 is what I was thinking. Oh, okay. Um, that's, that's fine. But if there's any questions, like, about Python or anything related to that, then definitely ask and we can talk about it because I have a lot of experience with Python. Um, so I guess the, the request was some Python tips and tricks. So there's a lot of things you can do with Python. Uh, so I was trying to think of what are things that are, I guess first, what is like people's experience with Python? Is this something that a lot of people program in or? I installed it on my Mac. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we have beginners? Raise your hand for your beginner. Rank beginner. Medium? Advanced? Oh, okay. Cool. You're not advanced. Oh, yeah, AI. Experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I didn't want to do like a tutorial of Python because that's, I didn't think that would be as interesting. So just like certain things that I've started to use along the way uh, that are really interesting. So is everyone, so I think that's the other question is who's familiar with the Jupyter Notebook? <clears throat> Most, so a lot of people. So if you're not familiar with the Jupyter Notebook, basically what it is is, so that's what I'm in right now. Um, so it's a, a web server. So it's running, basically, to launch it, you go to your terminal and you say Jupyter Notebook, and it launches this um, server. Okay, it, and it's just an internal thing? So yeah, it just runs locally on your computer. Uh -huh. It could run on an external server, uh -huh. but you access it through your web browser. So I okay. just go to localhost 8889, that's its local address, um, and you're able to connect to it. And you get this really nice kind of interface into the web browser. So um, here's the first view. So you get like a file browser view, uh, and then you have these notebooks, which are a combination of Markdown, HTML, and Python code that's executable. Okay. So it's a really nice way to play with Python and kind of like uh, when you're giving presentations in code to combine uh, Markdown and that. So the other thing, if you're familiar with Jupyter, uh, you might not be familiar with the MB extensions. So has ever anyone used MB extensions before? Did you say MB? NB extensions. Oh, NB. Yeah. Notebook yeah. yeah. So, oh, notebooks. Yeah. Okay. So, notebook extensions add kind of a lot to the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so, you can install these things, and then here's basically the list of all the ones that uh, there are. And so, there's, there's tons of other ones, too, but you can go and click on things. So, a lot of the ones, one of the ones I use a lot is Notify. So... Uh, basically, if you have long-running jobs running in your notebook, you can set this up and you'll get a desktop notification when that cell finishes executing. Mm. Um, there's, uh, so bqplot is an extension, and that's one of the things I'll go over today. Um, so how do we see this view again? How do you get to Jupyter Notebook, or how do you how get to... How do we get the NV extension? So you have to go and install it. So mm -hmm. it's Jupyter um, NV extensions. Oh, I don't have internet, but if you go there, uh, you'll find all of these extensions cool. there. You can set up your wireless yeah. thing. Do you need oh, it's a, I don't need internet. It's okay. okay. Yeah, so it's got a lot. Um, and what the extensions are is basically Python and JavaScript. So um, I wrote one of them, and so it's split cell notebook. So you can also write your own extensions, which is wow. kind of a good thing mm. to do. Um, and so what this one does just to give you an idea. Uh, um, so if I click here, it'll split the cell in half. And so a lot of times, if you're working like a pandas data frame and a graph or something, or you want to compare two things side by side, having this option in your notebook is really useful. Um, so you can write your own. There's another one, which is a dashboard view, which is really cool. The ability to split, if that was an NB extension, was that the BQ plot? What extension is it that gave us the ability the to split? The split? Or so that's split thing? cell. No. Split so, cell? Split cell. Yeah. So all that's doing is it's modifying the CSS and JavaScript of the notebook. And so it kind of, but it, it's pretty useful. Um, so there's lots of things. There's another one, which is, I think I have it enabled, which is the contents. 
Um, so if you're using markdown, so in the cells you have markdown, so if you have two hashes, it's like bold and one. Um, and so this gives you a table of contents, so you can kind of click through your notebooks. Um, so this is like another really nice thing for uh, if you're presenting or you're trying to build a tutorial. And so this is also just another extension. In content, content, right? What so is the name of the content? Is it also called content? Um, so let's see, I think, yeah, table of contents, yeah. There's a spells checker. There, there's a lot of different things. Um, they've got Pylint in here, Auto Pep 8. Uh, so it's it's kind of, you know, if there's something that you think Jupyter Notebook should do, and someone might have already done it. Um, there's lots of things around education, so like showing only, only showing uh, the solution after they do something and different things like that. Do you have anything for streaming? What kind of streaming? Like, like, come, like stock market data is coming directly you know, from the website. Real yeah, you data. can definitely do that too. Um, so uh, maybe medical data is coming directly, you know, from ER. You know. Yeah, yeah, you can you can do that with BQ plot. So I'll I'll go to that at the end. Um, so BQ plot is a two D and three D plotting library for Python and Jupyter notebooks, but Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is a Python path. Um, this is something that you may not really know much about uh, if you're a beginner, or intermediate, or even advanced. It's some things that people don't necessarily look at. So the Python, so your path is basically a search path for where it's going to look things up. So the first thing um, when you do, I want to import something in Python, it's going to go through a search path to look for that library. Uh, so. Um, and the order, so basically the order of that path is the order that it's going to find things. And if you want to modify the path, you can do that by, so if you want to put something at the beginning, say you have a package installed, but um, in your library uh, that you've done like a pip install, but then you check out the code and you want to instead have it find that code first, um, you would modify your path so it goes to that place first. So if you look here, we do, so I import sys and then I say sys.path. And so this says, this is the search path that Python's going to look for when it's looking for any package. Uh, so this one's running in a virtual environment. So basically, I've created a virtual environment, so it's looking here first for any Python packages. And if I want to modify that path, I can just do syspath append or syspath insert. And both of those things will change this path for this uh, just this instance of Python. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about, has anyone used PDB? One person. PDB. A couple of people. Okay. So PDB is Python's native debugger, and it's one of the best tools that you can learn uh, for debugging Python code. So um, it's very similar to GDB. Uh, if you've used C, uh, GDB is the C debugger. Um, so basically, you can take this line right here, import pdb, pdb.setTrace, and put it anywhere in your code. Um, and when you do that, what's going to happen is your code's going to run until it gets to this point, and then it's going to stop and wait for you to either um, put <coughs> input. So you can say, I want to go to the next line, I want to step into this function, list all the lines around. Uh, you can set a breakpoint, you can continue to the next breakpoint, or you can quit, and you can also print stuff. Um, so it's if you find yourself just doing print statements a lot, uh, this might be a better option than doing print statements. So just a, kind of a quick example. So, um, yeah. Yeah, in general, if you use any normal Python IDE, like a PyCharm, Spider, stuff, mm -hmm. you don't need to do any of this today. You just go on the interface, right click, and you can debug and put the play point. You can see everything, what, what's going on, you know. Yeah. You don't have to do any of this code, you know. Yeah. That's also using PDB. Right. Yeah, understand the background, but you don't have to write no typing. Just right click, start the debug, and put the brain point, you can see all the variables. Yeah. Whatever is going on with the program, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, definitely. So if you have PyCharm, it's got a built in breakpoint. So uh, maybe uh, that's what you've used. PyCharm is Pi like a, a Python IDE Pi that a lot of people use. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is just a simple, simple code to kind of go over, you know, how might I use the debugger? Uh, and maybe a few other things. So, 
um, we're just going to do a for loop. So for i in range 10 is just going to loop over i for 10 times. So it's going to i is going to go 1 through 10. So the first thing we're going to do is if i mod 2, which is going to take the mod of 2. Does everyone know? So if you have mod 2, you're either going to get 0 or 1 back. In Python, if you have an if statement, and if it's 1, it's true. If it's 0, it's false. So whenever it's um, this evaluates to 1, it's going to print continue. So, and then it's going to do continue. So in Python, the continue line says just skip to the next for loop. So it's just going to skip all of this and go back to here. Um, so if i equals 4, we're going to do a try accept statement. Um, so if you've used try accept before, basically if anything in your try statement fails, it raises an exception and you'll catch that exception here. Um, so you can either, when you catch the exception, you can either raise it again, um, or you can just print the message out. So like I know, I don't want my entire program to crash. I just want to see what the exception was. So I put try here, accept exception as E. So we're going to say, um, if we get an exception, we're going to call it E inside this, and we're going to print that exception out. Um, can you uh, run through it? Yeah, so I'll, run, I'll just explain it first, and then I'll run through it. Yeah. So then the last one we're going to hit is going to be i equals 8. Um, and so this is the kind of the last thing that you would use in for loop for kind of control is a break. Um, so break is just going to exit the for loop. You have two equal signs of the mm -hmm. So in Python, equals equals checks equivalency. Uh -huh. And one single equal sets that variable. So if I say okay. i equals 8, it's going to set i to 8. Uh -huh. But if I say equal equal, it's going to return, this is going to return either true or false, basically. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so if it returns true, it goes into the statement. If it returns false, it skips the if statement. Okay. Yeah. So the break command actually exits a for loop. Um, so these are kind of the three things that you might, might use uh, in your control flow. So let's just run through this once. So basically what you see here is you're going to see um, continue, continue. So what's happening? We're going to come... Actually, let's just step through it line by line. So I'll show you with pvdb. So we'll put the debugger in here so that we can step through it. So what happens here is it's going to come and it's going to hit pdb, and now pdb has this terminal right here. So what is i right now? i is 0. So it's going to come to i mod 2, and if I hit N, it's going to go to the next line. So I mod 2, just, oh, just to give you an idea, was 0. So it went to that if statement right here. It evaluated to 0, so it skips it. Now it goes to I equals 4 right here. Um, if we, we want to say, like, what's the code around this? I can hit L, and it prints out the, the lines surrounding it also, which is pretty nice. Um, so this PDB brings something like a comment yeah. Right? Yep. So if you are on like like a lot of times you'll use it if you're logging into a remote server or something like that. Um, it'll run your code till it gets to that point, and then it'll just pause, and you'll get this kind of shell right here. And so you can you can hit L to like shows the lines around it. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's just go next. So I is not eight, so it's just gonna append this guy and go to the next one. So now we're back up to the top. Hit next, next. Now it's is i mod two, print i. So it prints i, and it's going to hit continue, and jump back to the front. So for i in range ten again. Okay, and if I hit continue, it's just going to go to the next breakpoint, and so that breakpoint is pdb set trace. So if I want to set my own breakpoint, um, I can say b ten. Um, so let's see what i is first. Okay, so I'm going to say b10. So that says put a breakpoint at line 10, which is going to be this one right here. And if I hit continue, so now i is four. So now we should hit that breakpoint. Oh, oh never mind. <laughs> it's not going to hit the breakpoint because it's on that try. Okay, so basically we just hit i equals four. So what happened was um, when i equals four, it goes in to this try statement here. So I just put ASDF, it's just an undefined variable. So Python comes to that and it's like, I'm going to raise this exception. 
And then we just catch the exception here and we print it out. So that's what you're seeing here. 4, which was the value of <coughs> i, and then the name ASDF is not defined, basically. The PDB? PDB yeah, so P I'm just running PDB in Jupyter. So I'm saying what is the advantage of using Jupyter? Of using Jupyter? I just use Jupyter um, for like presentations and things like yeah. that. More graphical. Um, I like to use Jupyter because like say I'm writing code, like writing this code right here, mm -hmm. I can write it, hit shift E, run it, write it, just modify it, shift E, run it, instead of like having to go save a file, come run the file, look at the output. It's just much So, so much Jupyter nicer. is native, right, on your Mac? Uh, Jupyter will run on anything, yeah. any PC. I mean, is it native? You have to install it. No, no, it's a web oh, you do have to install it. Yeah, you have to install it. It's a web application. Yeah. Okay. So it's just pip install Jupyter Notebook if you have Python set up. And I do, actually, yeah. And I, I, I've been trying to... Um, on GitHub, there's a, a VPN uh, project, and I've been trying to <laughs> install it and finish it up, you know, so that my Mac, um, our mobile devices, my husband's PCs, well, not his work PC, but his home PC, um, can run through the VPN. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, without having to pay Norton some ungodly amount, you know, a month or because you know all of the um, ISPs now are tracking what you do and you know mm -hmm. they're selling your information, and so that was my reasoning for wanting to set up this VPN. But there's a point that I just can't get past, and mm -hmm. right now I don't remember what it is. But um, you know I did the pip install. Um, Python, all of that stuff is up to date, and mm -hmm. it just it just hits this brick wall, and I still mm -hmm. haven't been able to figure it out. Yeah, I don't know. It's driving me nuts. Okay, so uh, is this Jupyter compared to like Ruby in certain ways? Is it? Um, I haven't really used Ruby, but so Jupyter is just an interface. It can actually run. It has basically it runs on kernels. So you have this right. server, and it can run a bunch of different kernels. And the kernel can be Python, it can be C++, it can be anything. So inside this cell, you could actually be executing anything. Uh, it came from Python originally. That was like the original. IPython was the first thing, and then Jupyter built on top of that. And it's originally called IPython Notebook. Um, and then they decided to call it Jupyter Notebook because they wanted, They started adding kernels like R, and maybe Ruby has one, I don't know. Even Java, Scala, yeah. so many things. Can yeah, Julia. You can run, basically... It just is CSS and JavaScript on top of like calling the functions. So anytime you're in here, you're in a single Python exit like um, thread basically. And you're not writing any HTML at all, right? No, this is I'm logging into the web browser. Mm -hmm. So this is showing all it, HTML. Oh, yeah. it is showing all the HTML. Yeah, the only see everything in the one page. Like if you yeah. have another. Um, ID like Spider or PyChart, you have to struggle with like four, five, six windows. Like, yeah. Tell you where you know. So, so, so presentation, yeah. that's good. So to me, Jupyter has just been a like, presentation and teaching yeah. tool. But do you use it as your ID? A lot, yeah. I, I mean, I use it in combination. So usually, when I'm starting out to prototype something, I use Jupyter first because it's really quick to rapidly do that. Um, and then once I'm I've written my thing, I kind of put it into functions, and then I put that into like my, I use, right now I'm using Visual Studio Code to do all my oh, editing. Wow. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, I do believe, I do believe that question is very important. Jupyter is only used for presentation and classing. In real, a uh, company, in real production environment, using the real program like a uh, PyCharm, you know, and Eclipse, you know, and Spider, and Microsoft includes right now the Visual Studio Code that I use right now in Anaconda distribution package. Yeah. So you can go right now and install the, the Visual Studio Code. Very, very, very good, uh, 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 you know, for the, for the test editor. What's, for, the for What's the name? Visual, uh, Visual Studio, Studio Code. code. Yeah. So very like, popular today, yeah. I like... Like, yes. yes. Yes, data science, so yeah, for test. You import data and, like, play around with yeah. this. Yeah. You can make charts, you can yeah. explore data. Yeah. 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 Would you give an opinion about the PyCharm versus uh, 
I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for me, like I, I use like Vim a lot, and then the next thing I use is either Sublime Text or Visual Studio Code. Um, I don't typically like the the like giant IDEs, but that's just much up to preference, I think. Right. Uh, I know many companies here. How many people? No, number one, number one IDE is going to be it's going to be uh, it's going to be the uh, the PyShop. Yeah. Everybody using that. Number two is going to be the the uh, I believe it's going to be the uh, uh, well it is between you know the NetBeans you know Eclipse you know and the Spider something like that. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but in general you know in production environment we don't do that any of this type of production environment. You know? We don't do any of this Jupyter notebook nothing of this stuff. You know? Okay, let's keep going. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, Basically, we talked about the Python path. We talked a little bit about the debugging and the using PDB to do that. Um, so the next thing I wanted, I thought would be good would be just look at code profiling a little bit. And in code profiling, look at um, uh, use list comprehension and iterators as a way to kind of demonstrate what we would look for. So um, if I want to build an array of something, kind of the simplest way to do it you could think of would be uh, make a for loop and append to something, right, if you're kind of thinking in Python. So we do that. So here we have, we make m as an array, and we're just going to loop through a range of 10 and add to that. So then we get out, at the end, we get m. So another way you could actually write this would be um, x for x in range 10. And so this is what they call list comprehension. Um, and so What's the difference? Like sometimes when you hear people in Python say, oh, you should always write things in the most easy to understand way. Uh, and some people might think that the for loop is the most easy to understand thing. Um, as you get more familiar with these, these are like a, not, a lot nicer. Uh, so, I mean, this, I could have just said uh, like range 10 here. And I got the same thing. Um, so what if I wanted to do uh, like take the, um, square of x. So if I do, I can actually say x squared for x in range 10, and now I, I get back is this right here. So doing x asterisk asterisk to it is making x squared? Yeah, it's to okay. the power of whatever here. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and then so the other, maybe the other thing is, okay, instead of just doing that, maybe I want to have an if statement in there too. So you can actually say x to the power of 2 for x in range 10 if x mod 2. And so there, I only get um, this back for my list comprehension. So what is the, I'm sorry, what is the mod function? Doing? So it, it does mod that number. Um, so if you had uh, 10 and you do mod 2, it's going to basically give you back 0. But if you had 11 and you do mod 2, it's going to give you back 1. It's like the remainder of yeah. 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 whatever remainder is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so list comprehension is something that if you're not really familiar with and you're writing much for loops or things like this, you should learn list comprehension. Uh, and, cause, and I'll show you why. So um, here's a, a code profiling, time it. So anytime you're in Jupyter Notebook and you want to profile a code, this is another good reason to use it, use Jupyter for this sort of thing is I can hit, put the hash or percent percent time it and it's actually going to run like a time test. Um, so it ran one loop, best of uh, best of three. So this this right here took 1.18 seconds. So this is just doing our simple for loop um, with the raising to the power two. So now I'm going to do um, list comprehension uh, with the same thing and see what the difference in the time is. Um, so here you see 889 milliseconds. So actually writing it this way is not it's it's faster. So you always um, so if you're thinking like, oh, I should just keep writing for loops, it's actually a lot slower than doing list comprehension. Is it the runtime or system time or which time? Is the, how much it took to expand this for loop or what? You mean, what is, what's yeah, making, second, yeah, what is that, uh, this is how long it took to execute okay. this line of code. So that's the runtime. Like, yeah. Oh, the runtime. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Three point, yeah. Like, eight or nine milliseconds. Yeah. Right. And time is a Jupyter command or native Python command? Uh, well, this is a Python command that Jupyter calls. So if you just do time it, it's going to run this test. So even Python will take? Well, I don't know. Maybe IPython, but. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And so kind of the last thing to talk about is um, for this kind of the section of it is an iterator. So Python 3 does, when you do range, you get an iterator by default. Python 2, you have to call X range. So let's just call that. Um, so, okay. So it's even faster. Um, so these are kind of like three levels of optimization you might do in Python uh, when you're looking at code. So what exactly is X range? Um, basically, it's an iterator. I don't know how many people are familiar with iterators, but uh, Range builds the entire memory in list first and returns that. An iterator only does one at a time. Um, so, I know it's probably fast, but um, I'm going to, so here's a simple range. So this is what it's doing. If I call simple range 10, it's going to say something like i equals 0 while i is less than x, let's append. So it's going to build out that entire list and then return it. Okay, so this is just saying, all right, I'm going to build that. Now an iterator uses yield. Um, so what's going to happen here, so this is what an iterator of range would look like. Uh, I equals 0, while I less than x, yield 1. Okay, so what is yield doing? Let's run it right here. Um, oh, got it. Put that in okay. First. okay, so I, set, I created my iterator. So this is a generator object. So what happens is, so I said iterator to range 10, and I get this iterate <coughs> object. So nothing has actually happened yet. It hasn't created anything in memory. Versus this function here, which has already created everything in memory and returned the entire list. So to get the object out, you actually call iterate.next. So if I say iterate.next, 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 it's going to print 0, 1, 2. OK? Um, and well, so it's it's actually faster and more memory efficient. So I'll get to that in a second. So um, now, if I wanted to do kind of the same thing with the the list comprehension, so I've already iterated three times through this iterator, um, and so if I call this, you're going to see three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then it exits. So that iterator basically waits until like you execute it. When you say it's going to run until it gets to the yield. And then when you say next again, it run, starts from here, runs, to it gets to yield. Hit next, it runs until it gets to yield. Um, and so if we look at the memory difference, so this is a, a memory profiler um, that you can run in Python. So we'll have, this is just doing a for loop with simple range and a for loop with the iterator. So I'll just run both of those. All right, so basically this one had 11 megabytes of memory used. And this one used zero to do the exact same wow. thing. Okay, so the reason people use iterators instead of like the standard range is if I have a really big number that I want to loop over, you don't want to um, build the entire thing in memory and loop over it after. You just want to have an iterator that just emits one at a time. So um, the iterator does it one at a time, but does it require an input from you? Writer. Yeah, so the input was I created this iterator object and I told it was 10. Uh -huh. So basically, the way that works is you can call next on this and it'll give you the next value. That it okay, would. so it's like you just like if you want it all 10, you do it 10 times? Yeah. Or 9 times? Yeah. Usually you just create the iterator and then you do like a for loop on that iterator. Oh. instead of building out the entire object first and then doing a for loop. Okay, um, so I know that was kind of quick to go through those concepts, if, like the list comprehension, but they're, they're really useful to learn. Um, they take a little while to like wrap your head around, but once you do, they're really useful. So the next thing I wanted to go over was interactive visualizations, because uh, usually, that's kind of like one of the sticking points when you start wanting to do um, like data science or any really anything. But uh, for me, it was data science. Like, how do I visualize this data um, in a nice interactive way, or how do I present this data to other people? Uh, and a lot of times, people end up using like Matplotlib, um, which is really flexible but also static, um, and so you don't you kind of lose out on a lot of um, interactivity that you might see in like D3JS or these other really nice web plotting libraries. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about IPy widgets, and then I'm going to talk about bqplot. And so IPy widgets is basically um, widgets for Python and Jupyter Notebook, and then bqplot is a subset of IPython widgets for specifically for plotting. Um, so you have to install all of these. Yes. As well. So pretty much in Python, any new import is a pip install. So oh, like okay. pip install IPy widgets, pip install Jupyter Notebook. Pip Just install. to kind of check about five more minutes. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay. 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 Um, so I'm going to import hbox, vbox, and dropdown. And then I'm going to make out this color map. So this is another list comprehension, except instead of a list, it's a dictionary. So you can also do dictionary comprehensions. Yeah, I didn't know. What is the individual uh, significance of each library, like like Hbox, Vbox? So, so this is the library, and then these are the functions. Or actually, these are classes that I want to import. Okay. So what is function? Like, what is the significance? What does like Hbox and Vbox yeah, do? Yeah, I'm going to show you. Okay. Yeah. So, I, so I'm going to make a so colors array, and then I want to make a dictionary for color map. So What, what is the enumerator? So enumerate, what it does is it's going to, um, so I have colors this array, and when I call enumerate on it, what it's going to do is instead return the index, well, let me just write it out for you. So oh, okay. index, list, right? yeah. comma, value. Yeah. Allocation. Yeah. Allocation by domain. It's just like, yeah. yeah, instead of like yeah. writing out, compl like it's just a, Nice way of doing Zero this. Three instead of red and green. So it's basically instead of Q B I, right? Yeah. So I get I get I get two values out of it. I get the index and the value, <coughs> and I, it's just a nice way to put it into a for loop. Um, so I use it here to build out this color map. So this is using a dictionary comprehension kind of builder thing where I have key value coming out of this iterator and I just put it in a dictionary. All right, and now I'm going to use this drop down. So let me put this in the split cell. So the drop downs are actually really nice. Um, so I have this drop down now. I can click on it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then if I want to get the value out, see I have d dot value. So that was four. It was orange. I go to switch it to yellow. See, it's actually changing the Python values as you're changing the HTML. If I have, so now here, here is also the same object. So if I change it here, you see it changes here, and the value also changes. Um, so there's tons of widgets. You can go to the, the IPy widget page and look at it, and you can combine them in all sorts of ways um, to make really elaborate dashboards. So I'll show you kind of a few examples real fast. Um, so now we're going to use bqplot. So I want to make a simple line chart. So here's here's kind of the first thing. Everyone, like if you're using matplotlib, this is really simple. You'd be like, why would I want to do this? Mm -hmm. um, so this is using bqplot. I'm I'm not going to go over it too much just kind of, since we don't have a lot of time, but just to show you. So now I'm going to combine a drop down and a bqplot. So here now I have my plot, um, and then I have my color box. So if I come here and I switch it. You see the graphs changing interactively. Okay. Um, yep. So now another thing, if I want to, so I make a bar chart, and when I hover over, I actually get information out about it here. So these, this comes really useful. Um, okay. And then so the last thing is kind of like a data science example. All right. So in in this thing, I had a. Uh, I was going back to the directory structure. So um, in this folder, I have a lib folder. And in lib, I have feature vector distribution.py. So like when I was talking about the system path earlier, this feature vector distribution isn't in my path. But if I just do sys.path.append, now I can import it. Um, and so here's kind of here's one of the things I built for a BQ plot. Um, so here you can hover over these and you see like what this point is. Um, you've got the so this is a plot of feature vectors. If probably if you've done like some of the data science stuff, you've come across the leap data set for Iris. So this yeah. is just plotting that. Um, so I can come here and I can select different features and see now it's changing the plot interactively. 
um, and it's changing these here for this. And so I just show this as an example of you can do really elaborate things um, with this uh, kind of visualization library that aren't really possible in any other. So those lib folders aren't libraries, right? Is that what you're saying? It's just a folder that I made. I uh -huh. just made, called it lib. Oh, you And I had a file that. inside. Oh, okay. And so I'm, I want it to import that file, but it wasn't in my path, so it didn't find it. I so I just append to my path and read it. Okay. So, so how easy is it to turn, like, turn these graphs into like an application? Like well, that, you know, you, that could just be like outside of my Python. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, when you will do features in the one for x and another for y, right? Yep. Yeah, so, so x and y. So, x and y. Okay. so basically, with this, it's plotting a scatter plot of x yeah. versus y, and then a histogram for each of these values. Um, so here you see the histogram for this class, this class, and this class, like that. And the histogram is also on the side? Is yep, so it's a histogram of feature one and a histogram of feature two. Oh, I get it. So feature two is up here and feature one's right here. I see. And what was the IPI, IPI something? IPI widgets. Widgets. Okay. Yeah. So these these are all IPI widgets and BQ plot widgets. Um, and so actually, every single point you see here is an IPI widget, which is what BQ plot does. Basically, turns all of your plotting stuff into widgets, and so you can do. Those widgets only work in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, well, kind of. Easily, um, right? They're, they're actually working on making IPI widgets have its own kind of web server. Um, so this is actually just running CSS um, and JavaScript in the notebook. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, we'll run out of time. But thank you, Chris, for being right along. I thought that was awesome, and the visualization was cool. And if you don't mind, we can share yeah. the recording. Is that okay? Awesome. Put it on the YouTube.